Welcome everybody. We have uh, a handout for you. We, we imagined that we would have a conversation um, with you and it would be uh, very much like a case discussion. And uh, it's a topic that just, just a, a two page reading. So, um, why don't we, do we need to introduce ourselves? Yes. All right. uh, my name is David King and I'm uh, uh, senior lecturer here. I've been here for 22 years and I see familiar and friendly faces in the crowd. And I teach courses on Congress. I chair the MPA program. So I chair the commission's committees for the MPA program as well. Uh, I also am the faculty chair of the program for newly elected members of Congress. And so we do the training for new members of Congress. Um, not very successfully, apparently. <laughs> since 92, we lost them for a year in 94, and we've had them back, um, and I've been back the chair since 96 at that program. So we're hoping that we'll have a nice bumper crop here again in the fall. And uh, it's fun having conversations with new members, and the kinds of conversations that we hope will happen based on these two pages are the kinds of conversations that they have. Michael. Uh, Mike Lignatiev, I'm a professor at the Kennedy School, a colleague of David's. Uh, the thing you need to know about me in addition, and I see many former students and it makes my little heart beat faster, and I, I kind of wondered what happened to you all, and now I'm going to find out. Um, uh, the relevant element of my background for this discussion is that I was for five and a half years in the Parliament of Canada as an elected officials so that I am a member of parliament. Um, some of you, I think, are representatives uh, in, uh, in assemblies around the world. Uh, the issue of transparency is a very acute and difficult one for politicians, and I bring to this conversation some exposure to it as a, not merely a theorist of politics, but uh, for five and a half years, um, a practitioner of politics. And so, uh, Going to talk through the case. Yeah, we'll talk through the case. I just want to identify a few people who are in the room. Marjorie Decker is our state rep on the school. So Marjorie represents this building in the state house, and she was in Cambridge uh, City Council for years. And Jim uh, Montgomery was the mayor in Illinois, uh, now uh, lives and works in Boston. Who else in here has had elective office? Or currently holds elective office. Well, we won't just put the entire conversation down on Tim and Marjorie's shoulders. Uh, so we have a couple options. One option is that everyone takes time now and really reads this. The other option is, since I, I decided to print it out on uh, 16 type, I, that I could actually read without the glasses. I'll just read it fairly quickly. So and then you have to read it yourself. So um, uh, questions that I would like us to um, engage in conversation include, what should be transparent? And the opposite of that is sort of what shouldn't be transparent? Or what is the opposite of, of transparency? I'd like us to think about um, whether concepts of transparency are, are thought about or felt differently for people who are elected and people who are not elected. And um, we'd like to think about different levels of government. Whether we expect different kinds of transparency at different levels of government local, state, federal, international, uh, and so forth. And whatever else is going to come to mind. So the, the room isn't really organized as a regular case discussion room. And uh, when we first talked about this, we were imagining we'd be around a table with 12 people. It's not going to be quite the same. So feel free to swivel your chairs at any time and, and try and engage in that conversation. Here we go. This is from uh, Time Magazine. Um, and this is from uh, the last fall. Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper, a potential 2016 Democratic candidate for president, has a creative and controversial idea for ending Washington, D.C.'s partisan gridlock. Start legislating from behind closed doors, following on other calls to bring back the earmark. After decades of fights for transparency in government, Hickenlooper told Time that those well-intentioned initiatives are making government and lawmakers less effective, quote, we elect these people to make these difficult decisions, but how are they, but, but now they are in the full light of video every time they make a decision. Even Luber said at the National Government Association meeting in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We elected these people, let them go back into a room like they always did. 
One Republican governor in attendance endorsed the idea on the condition he not be named. <laughs> this seemingly counterintuitive opinion that outcomes could improve if the process is obscured is catching on in Washington among political elites of both parties as a way of making a dysfunctional Congress work again. Last year, Representative Thomas Reed, a Republican from New York, called on his party's leadership to reinstate earmarks in a bid to provide a tariff break to one local business. And House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee Chairman Bill Schuster made it clear he disagrees with the official Republican position opposing such specialized spending. Likewise, Democratic appropriators want to bring back the old system. Well, earmarks in a responsible way, uh, where it's all public, you know, where you want, well, you know what you want and you know what you're going to get. I think it's very, very helpful because uh, who knows the district better than a member? That was need alone. Um, the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, implemented a ban on reforms, federal funding for pet projects of lawmakers, when Republicans took the House of Representatives in 2011 as part of a push towards transparency and fiscal responsibility. But many have argued that the pork barrel spending served to grease the legislative reel, wheels on Capitol Hill and blame their absence for contributing to Washington's legislative scale. Jim Manley, a former uh, top aide speaker to Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, called the earmark ban, quote, one of the worst decisions Congress has made in recent years. Uh, you get the members with the earmarks interested in the process and actually helping to try and push forward a piece of legislation. That's why you have them, he said. In the first, by the way, the latest Congress is the latest year is even worse than what I'm about to read to you. In the first six months of the, the, the 113th Congress, just 22 bills, almost none of them significant, have passed both chambers, the fewest number since records began being kept six decades ago. The 112th Congress, the first with the ban, was just as unproductive. Higginlooper uh, cited constitutional framer James Madison saying part of the way he envisioned democracy working was that you had to trust these people that you elected. But there's little momentum within Congress to revert to the old way of doing things in the hopes to grease the wheels of lawmaking. And with Republican conference still holding to anti-spending to lawmakers, <coughs> quote, this is pretty simple. Earmarks aren't coming back anytime soon, Boehner spokesperson um, Brendan Buck said. And then there's this uh, update at the bottom from um, <laughs> from the Looper's communication. The governor doesn't support bringing back earmarks. <laughs> well, this isn't a conversation necessarily about earmarks, so it's very, it's an interesting topic, um, but probably more interesting for me and the Muslim. It's about the concept of uh, transparency and being able to deal in a quiet, closed space. And the, a couple of the questions we'd like you to think about are, are uh, what should be transparent, you know, really should be transparent. And then on the opposite, what is the opposite of transparency? Uh, and then um, we'd like to have you think generally about politics. But Mike, let's begin with your reactions, because we've had some fun conversations about this. And oh, I'm, I, 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 I should say that the Kennedy School does not endorse um, complete confidentiality on everything, right? We think that maybe some things ought to be transparent. So, but it's a very interesting topic. Michael. Uh, I ran a political party for two and a half years, um, the Liberal Party of Canada, and I had 150 people in caucus. And caucus would meet every Wednesday morning, between 9 and 12. And it was basically where we made our basic decisions about what to support, and where we listened to each other. I'd sit up on the dais and all the members are up front. And as leader, it was the most important meeting in terms of just figuring out what's the temperature in the room? What are the, what are the folks thinking? What, how do they think a certain measure is going to play? And remember, Canada is the largest democracy by size in the world. So the regionalism is, is acute. And if you think as a leader that you know what the temperature is in the Yukon, well, you can assume it's going to be 30 degrees colder than Toronto, but you're not going to have any idea of how a measure is going to play in the Yukon or in New Brunswick or in the same as your country, the enormous diversity of the place. It, you need a confidential space in which people vent as a leader. Um, Ronnie Heifetz talks about holding spaces, you know, holding rooms where people can vent, they can say stuff they don't necessarily want to go to the state for, but they, they want to get it off their chest. 
They want to represent positions that they may later want to back away from. Uh, they want to score cheap points against some of their colleagues. They want to score cheap points against their leader for public consumption in the room. You've got to have confidential rooms where a lot of steam gets blown off and a lot of, and a leader then comes out with a sense, okay, this is kind of where the group is, you know. Um, but if that uh, is, if it's transparent, it simply stops. So the one thing I would say about transparent decision making is that as soon as the caucus, were the caucus deliberations to be transparent, the decisions would not be made in the caucus. <coughs> That's one of the downsides of transparency that needs to be, I think, firmly understood. Um, when we began to discover that there were leaks inside my caucus, and that people were blabbing this stuff out to the media who gather at 12 noon, you know, at the end of every caucus meeting, it just, I said to the, to the men and women, I said, listen, if you want a discussion in this room, you've got to shut your damn mouth. If you don't, I'm going to make the decisions. And I'm going to make them with three people that I can trust. And so the magic word here is trust. I think the thing that's really interesting about transparency is, you know, we all got Brandeis in our mind about sunlight being the best disinfectant, and we all strongly believe, I strongly believe, for example, that the minute money comes into politics, every single dime of it has to be disclosed. I'm a radical on that, I don't care, uh, and I don't think money is speech, I think money is power, and it has to be controlled, that's another conversation. There would be, to, to your question, David, total transparency on money. That's just my, maybe a Canadian thing. But <laughs> deliberation, that's, that's where my, my point is. Deliberation, those preliminary decisions, deliberations for decision making, the holding room you need in order to keep a team together so that they can vent and express their fears and anxieties and doubts and question your leadership, that also happens, is crucial. The minute you lose the trust uh, of, of, and that begins to leak, uh, then decision making shrinks to the narrow team that you can trust. And so these, I think, are obvious points. I see some of you nodding your head, but believe me, I live this stuff. And, and I, so I believe in money, transparent, deliberation, confidential, uh, voting, public and accountable, right? But the, the, the deliberation is what I care, care about as a... Uh, and, and, the, and the key issue here is... Uh, the key issue here is, is, is trust. If I can push it to one other area, and then I really will stop. When I, when I teach this stuff about what it is to be a representative, and, and David teaches congressmen, so no... Congress people knows better than I do. The traditional way you think about representation is a representative is either a delegate or a trustee. You may remember this from your classes here. A delegate essentially executes the orders of those who can send her there. It's a very tight control being a representative. A trustee administers a trust and has leeway to decide what is in the general interest. I actually thought that neither of those models describe what I did as a politician. What I did was politics, right? What I did was politics. And to do politics, you have to have rooms where what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? And then you take it out of the room, and you sell it, and you either succeed or you fail. But unless you have a deliberative space which is safe, you can't do what you're sent there to do, which is politics. And that's why I think Hickenlooper is actually right. And I think you've got to fill, you've got to bring back those deliberative spaces where the media is not there, it doesn't leak, the staff are sent out, and you just start sawing it out. And, and so, and, and, and sorry, but that, that would be kind of my 
So transparency takes us to trust, and it takes us to actually what representative democracy is. And that's why it's such an interesting subject. So, yeah, I just want to mention one quick thing that we'll give you, that, and this is this idea that <clears throat> the, the, the deliberation or the decision still had to be made someplace. And in the 1970s, when conference committees, the rules between you know, the House and the Senate, they have, to, they have to take a bill and make it identical. So they had a special committee. They used to be private. They became public under law in the 1970s. And then more people wanted to be on the conference committees, and the cameras were there, the press was there. <clears throat> so uh, they ended up having to make decisions where? During the bathroom breaks. And the decisions were made in the senators only bathrooms. <coughs> and they would just huddle in there. It became a very important <coughs> moment in gender uh, problems right on, on Capitol Hill. And out of that was this clamoring for bathrooms for female senators as well, which probably should have been there all along. The decisions <laughs> really end up happening during the breaks in the bathrooms. And, um, and if women wanted to be part of those decisions, they had to actually go in to the men's bathrooms. Uh, so you have all this weird, this kind of distortion that happens. Increasingly what we see, certainly uh, on, on TV, is just for public consumption. Right? Because everybody's watching, now people can grandstand, uh, and you don't get the same kind of deliberation. This idea about politics, my life, is, is really right. And I, and I also uh, resonate with this uh, idea that trust is central to it all. I see lots of hands. Wait. Uh, first person who had his hand up is back there. Tell us who you are. And um, Pat McCormick and uh, uh, mid-career in 2005, and former student of, of Michael's. Um, I guess I, I tend to agree with this idea that some deliberation you know, should be shielded from the media and public eye. However, to me the fundamental question is, is it enough to know about full transparency on the money and influence and then the outputs of the votes? Or is part of the transparency required? What is the money doing to those conversations? How are representatives influencing each other and lobbyists them in that deliberative process? Where particularly in the US, we have a, we have a real problem. But even in parliamentary democracies, I lived in Australia for six years, where there's not big money. There's still big power and influence. And what I worry about is, the deliberation is where the influence occurs. And it's not enough to know the votes in terms of what is undermining democracy. And I, I, I mean, I'm interested in what other people I'm, think. I'm interested in everybody getting in on that. I just wanted to ask yeah. a clarification yeah. point on what you were actually trying to do in the caucus. Were you putting together the Liberal Party agenda that yes. would then be put out and hopefully voted on? Uh, we were a party of opposition, so we were in a parliamentary system in opposition. We would have bills coming up that we would have to vote on, and so we were figuring out what the party's position would be on a prospective piece of legislation. <coughs> or we would be dealing with something as vulgar as, you know, our polls are not going so well, why aren't we doing better, you know, intimate political discussions about how we get our message out more effectively. So some of it was prospective legislative business, and some of it was just political, you know. Image management. Yeah, yeah that kind of stuff, yeah. Okay. yeah. And then the other thing I was going to ask is, um, I find, in, certainly in Britain, people are loathe to vote against their party, where they cross the aisle here all the time. So I was going to ask what goes on in Canada. Are they crossing the aisle more like they do here, or are they more like the Brits? We, we have very tight party discipline which is another reason why the caucus deliberation is so important. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want freelancing. Marjorie? So first I would just ask that if anybody's not tweeting out anything that's being said. Um, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, this not is my home. Not tweeting what you're saying. <laughs> what, I, what I'm saying, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I guess what I would say is that, you know, so we, we have a caucus every week as well. So I'm a, a member of the Democratic Party. The Democrats and the Republicans, every week we have a caucus <coughs> on how we're going to vote and just try to hash it out. And one of the things that happens in the caucus already is there is no trust. I mean, the caucus also becomes sort of a, a show. Um, it's already established who's going to say what, and you kind of know who's going to sort of oppose that in the caucus because people are right there tweeting stuff out or they're emailing advocates and they're getting it out to their groups. And before we even get out to the, to the press, like stuff's already out. So for
for many of us that just kind of, those conversations are happening privately anyway, even when they are confidential. And this idea that somehow if you have a private deliberation is that, you know, does that actually hinder the ability to really understand the democratic process? Um, it, they're already private. It, it, it doesn't matter how transparent you think they are. You, in some ways, the more transparent, and again, I'm speaking in generalities here, the more transparent you are, the more you're forcing those conversations behind closed doors, because they are happening. I spent 14 years on the city council in Cambridge, and the legislature, in its wisdom, applied an open meeting law to municipalities, but not to itself. So as a body of nine city councilors, we have a half a billion dollar budget in Cambridge. Um, it's not small change. And we tried to create these round table discussions for the city council where there's no TVs, because we're televised in Cambridge. Um, and then there's no TVs for the round tables. And we've had new members of the council come on and insisted that these round tables be televised. Now these round tables are public can come. Um, but the idea that somehow the, the whole point of taking the television off is so that people could um, have <coughs> blunt conversations, and even part of that blunt conversation is to just always remember that people in elected official, uh, elected official, they're, they're people. They have personalities. They have egos. They have feelings. Um, and even the best of us who uh, try to rise above <coughs> things, and I'm not always one who always has risen above things, um, not always on the balcony, but. Um, Sometimes they just need to get it out with each other. You just need to be able to be such a jerk, you know, and you stop being such a prick. Like, I mean, you just need to be able to go back and forth and kind of get that out so that you can actually get to the substance. You can't do that when everything is in front of the public eye because nobody wants to believe their elected official is not always civil and, because um, that's already the worst of what they think of elected officials is not being able to get along. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's a complicated process even when we think it's transparent. Um, it's not. But it does hinder the ability to have um, honest sort of relational conversations that allow people to sort of get things off their chest um, and then be able to go to the substance. I'm Marilyn Abel, I'm an environmental attorney, and uh, John Hickey Looper is my governor. He used to drink at his bar. He <laughs> <laughs> transferred to that about my own background. Um, I think it's the process of transparency that has to be to transparent to people. You have to explain to them why you need to be behind closed doors and make the rules fairly obvious to people because um, there are some contexts where you really have to have an enclosed space to talk about things and the public needs to understand that and they under need to understand why it's important. So I think explaining mm -hmm. why you're not being open and, and in, Bold in Colorado the um, the sunshine laws for local municipalities are really severe so that you can't even, if you're on city council, you can't even talk to another city council member on the phone about some things because that's a violation of, of some of the sunshine rules. And uh, it, it's just gotten out of control. But if, you, if you're going to allow people to be behind closed doors or without cameras, um, the public, it, it needs to be explained to the public. So I think some transparency of the process in addition to money, it's, it's important. Let me highlight this concept again of trust. And, and to do politics, we have to trust that people are going to, to be able to do politics. Maybe if people understand sort of what is actually happening in those closed rooms, they mm -hmm. would. And, and we, we trust local governments in the United States. Um, and for the most part, people trust local governments much more than they do the state <coughs> and a whole lot more than they do the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, and so when, when we had um, you know, the marathon bombings, there was a remarkable amount of trust that Ed Davis and the, and the governor had things under control and we were going to let them do what they needed to do. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. So I think open it up so that people understand they can trust the process, but we have this long history of antagonism in, in many cases where we haven't been able to trust the process. But I, I think Patrick is, 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 I feel troubled by it. Patrick's point of whether what Marilyn was saying meets that objection. That is, if people are informed about the, the process by which we decide what is public and what is private, whether that meets your difficulties. That, I'm, I'm not sure that it does, but what, what do you think? You know, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think that some of the changes happening in democracy, you know, it's correlation versus causation, are not because of 
lots of transparency in peer-to-peer -peer digital communication and changing media landscape. We might attribute a lot of our issues with that, and certainly like to slow things down and have people be thoughtful and deliberative. I don't think all the polarization in the U.S., for example, is due to that. And so therefore, if we close some of the process, keep all the money, keep the polarization, keep the corporate interest, we could also get the worst of both worlds. I mean, I'm not, I'm not convinced. All the way back. Uh, hi, Carol Karen, a lawyer from Los Angeles. I, uh, I was not ever an elected official, but I did sit on a very controversial, uh, controversial state board in California, where we had various constituencies who had very different cultural beliefs as to what should happen. And when I first went on the board, this is many years ago, we were allowed to uh, deliberate privately. And the only way that we could get anything done, and, and we were charged with a particular task, was that we, we needed to compromise. Yeah. And I think that that's the key to governing, is you have to be able to compromise. And when everything is political, and you have very diverse constituencies that are very strong in their beliefs, you're not going to get any compromise when you have the cameras on you. So the only way we could get compromise was to be able to deliberate privately People became, uh, you know, after initial name calling, people became a lot more receptive to listening and trying to figure out a solution that would be <coughs> as best a win-win. And then, quite frankly, they would go back to their constituencies and spin it however they wanted to spin it without right. personal embarrassment or loss of individual prestige. And we were able to, to accomplish things when it switched and every all deliberations had to be public, uh, our effectiveness really ceased and we weren't able at from that point on. Luckily we had to accomplish more at the beginning portion, but we weren't able to get anywhere further than that. So Carol, I think you, you don't have compromise, you can't do it. Um, when you say things switch, there's, is that called the Brown Rule? Is that what yes, the, the current? Yeah. Could you articulate what that is now? Just well, I'm not really, I'm not really staying on top of it, honestly. But, but all of our deliberations had to be public, and so everything was open. We no longer, we couldn't even talk to each other. Like right, you right. talked about so the bathroom, it was, yeah. it was illegal to actually for me to. I was the chair of that board. It was illegal for me to call anyone. It was illegal. There, there were no other women, so I couldn't meet in the restroom, but I couldn't go in the men's room if I had a let them to go in because it would, you know, it would really, it would be personally uh, very negative to do that. And people were worried about it, and people were vigilant about uh, following through and making sure you didn't do that. And so nobody uh, could compromise because they couldn't go home. They couldn't go back, and they... And so, really, we were at a loss. And quite frankly, we got some uh, laws passed. We accomplished our initial purpose when we could do it. And to the point about the money, I think that's, in my case, that wasn't so important. But I think money is uh, obviously the big issue here. But I think it also goes back to what you said about trust. Because ultimately, you know what the vote is. And you know whether whoever you elected or put on there is ultimately effective for you or not, and maybe that's the bottom line if we don't want to have a continual gridlock. <coughs> it feels a little bit like ping pong, so I don't want it to, so we, we can uh -huh. open it up to conversations with you all, but who, who wants to hear next? Yeah, like. I'm Andy Broadening, I'm Ed May, I'm from the UK. Um, been involved in a number of uh, activities around the open government field internationally, and in some sense I'm, I'm trying now to work out whether actually this, this ought to continue or not. It seems to me really important work around open data, opening up data that, that the government has collected, which should be open to citizens. Uh, we're seeing examples of, of open policy making where a government has to take people with them, for example, around uh, disclosure of personal information for you know, better use of public services. So these are examples of open government which are kind of moving, and I'm trying to kind of work out whether you know this bandwagon has just gone too far uh, or not. And I, I, I just wonder whether, and I take that I absolutely agree with the point um, about money. Thank you for that because transparency is a part of accountability. Accountability is for those who have 
power over our lives. That's not just government, it's also kind of business as well. But I just, I wonder whether, I hear politicians so many times have this nostalgia for why don't people trust politicians? How do we get back to this trust? And I just wonder if you're a bit like the record companies why, wondering why people don't buy vinyl. You know, that actually the exam question is, we are in an open age. Uh, we're in a, you know, an age where openness and transparency is accelerating. How do you do politics in that context rather than why can we put fingers in the dark? Well, just, I think that's a great challenge, and I think Patrick's challenge is a good challenge, too. And I, I absolutely don't want to be defending vinyl. That seems to be like the wrong <laughs> um, I think we should add open consultation. I mean, the, con the consultative side, open data, absolutely. Um, uh, open data for a bunch of high-minded reasons and then some low-minded reasons. And the low-minded reason is that data government collects a whole bunch of data which can be actually a source of innovation and profit and development for private corporations. It seems good. It can also be a source of um, civic education. So open data, absolutely. And open consultation. I mean, I, I felt some of the best political work I did was just sitting in rooms with people in, in, in public hearings and just listening and saying, okay, we want to do this. What, what do you think? Now, let's not get sentimental about that. That the, the open consultation process can get you jammed. The more you take this out to the public, the more narrowly your options tend to get framed. But I'm still pretty firm about the deliberative side. Okay, we've we've listened, we've opened the data, we've listened, and now we got to make up, some, we got to make some decisions. And I've got to have, we've got to have a space in our political system where the deciders say, okay, I did the consultation, we let the data out there, we've had white papers, green papers, blue papers, we've done all that, but now we've got to, now we've got to come up with something we can all live with. And we've got to, I think the point made at the back is so good, how do you create the space for compromise? How do you create that deliberative space in which people can actually compromise without losing face, without losing credibility? So, oh. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> now, it's a high mind to change. <laughs> It has the advantage that we can be seen at the back, and the back is part of the front and all that stuff. Greater transparency. Well, <laughs> yeah, now you see. <laughs> um, you directly taken on this question of whether one needs to be elected or, or behaves differently if you are elected or not. You are appointed, is that correct? Yes. And, and yet you still feel the inability to have a safe space for deliberation and compromise. And you're in the business of doing politics, right? Yes. Collaboration, yes. compromise, yes. representing the various constituencies, even if you were appointed as opposed to elected. Right. I don't so, think it makes a difference. It does, yeah. It's not a knife edge difference. So you do have your hand. Well, um, so Desiree from Canada, I'm an active member of the party that. Oh, God, elect. Desiree, so very uh, very happy to support Michael when he was leader of our party and member of parliament. So uh, I run a foundation though that's affiliated with McGill and what we do is we um, recruit the next generation of public leadership from around Canada and the world. Uh, but just speaking to political experience, someone who's been very involved in, and also when we were in government, I was a senior advisor. So at, at, on the non-elected side and looking now at running for office, um, I guess my sense is uh, maybe a little bit too, I guess, Frank? Or no, Patrick, Patrick at this point, sorry. Um, so in Canada, we have, and to Michael's point, we have uh, campaign limits, so spending limits. So you can't contribute more than about $1,000 per person. There's a ban on corporate and union donations. So I don't, I'm not concerned that when my caucus is meeting about the influence, there are other forms of influence, but right. money is a big one. And so it seems to me maybe there needs to be a correlation between the kind of influence money might play at a level of transparency, right? Because if you know you're getting big corporate dollars, you kind of want to see how that's playing out. So it seems to me there needs to be some kind of link there. But in my mind, even though we've got this great caucus system in Canada, um, and I think a great uh, way of public financing also for some of the campaigns, although the current government's trying to get rid of that, um, 
it, it seems to me that still so many of the decisions are actually being made by the non-elected advisors of various leaders. I mean, that's the reality. So in my own situation, people are saying, do you really want to run for office? Do you want to just continue to advise the leader? And that's really where you can have the influence. So, you know, and those discussions are certainly not transparent. So certainly there has to be a place for, um, in fact, I just come from Professor Mansbridge session on getting to yes, and one of her key criteria for um, integrated negotiation, i.e. getting to yes, is in fact privacy and informality. Having those safe spaces where you can be not grandstanding, but venting, uh, building trust, and that was one of the three top criteria. So certainly there's, there needs to be a place for that in, in terms of getting to yes and, and getting good decisions. But it, I still feel that so many of the decisions are actually not made by elected officials and they're made by advisors to various leaders. And that's yeah, there's a big, I think that's a crucial point because um, I'm a passionate believer in representative democracy. Why else would I? leave this place and go and run for office. But my basic takeaway was the hollowing out of representative democracy, the emptying out of that as a place where decisions are taken. Is it because that's where the spotlight is? That's the disturbing question. I mean, Patrick said earlier, and I think that's in fact the way to think about it, look, there's a lot more going on than just the, the transparency push. Lots of other things are happening. But there's no question. Um, you've got a real question to ask yourself. Can I have more influence being an uh, unelected policy advisor to a minister than a member of parliament or even a minister? Uh, there's something that's happened right across the world here. Um, those of us in the spotlight are much more power powerless than I ever imagined. Now, granted, I was in opposition the whole time. Glad I did it. I'm not, but but that's everywhere you go in Western liberal democracies. You see <coughs> members of Parliament saying, "What do we do here? Mm -hmm. What what are we doing? The spotlight is upon us. We play these games under intense media scrutiny, mm -hmm. but uh, we don't have the capacity to do what I think we're here to do, which is to do politics." There used to be this old, old, you know, saying when I was in grad school and, and working on the Hill. That was that 80% um, of the work is done by 20% of the members, and 80% of the work is done the last 20% of the days. And now no one agrees with that, right? The answer that the standard line, which is also not quite extreme enough, is that 90% of the work is done by 10% of the members, and 90% of the work is done by in the last 10% of the days. Um, in January 2009, uh, when the new members were uh, the new members of Congress were had <coughs> left here and they were down in D.C., there were two members who had known each other well uh, outside of uh, outside of Congress that went in as brand new members. Um, we spent a fair amount of time. I knew both of them very well. Uh, spent a lot of time together at the new members orientation, and they went down to D.C. and they were riding down an escalator. Not an elevator, but an escalator together, and talking to each other. You know, just standing and talking to each other. And uh, one party—I'm not going to say which party—but one of the parties then called one of those members in uh, to an office and said, "You know, look, we, we noticed that you're spending time with you riding on <laughs> the escalator together." And, you know, you can choose your friends, but um, I don't think it's going to be good for your career. It was the first month in Washington, good for your career. Uh, so he called me and we talked about it. And it was, uh, it, 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 now, it, who has the power in those kinds of relationships? Well, the party leader. Where are the decisions being made? Like, completely at the level of the party leaders. It's not 10% of the work. 10% of the members doing 90% of the work. Right now, the, the critical decisions are in just a handful of offices, a handful of people, a handful of senior advisors, and it's not the democracy that we thought we had. And just to add to that, I think that's why we see, at least in the 90s, some of the 2000s, like many of my students at McGill, when they're thinking about how they want to make an impact in the world, aren't thinking about elected office of government. They're thinking about social enterprise, 
they're thinking about business and why you see these protests at these global summits, that's where people feel the decisions are made, being made, not in parliaments, not in Congress. It's, it's outside of that. So where do we need to see the transparency is not necessarily the elected bodies or legislatures at all. Um, I just, say, I just come from Iran uh, like last week, and in fact, uh, I'm working on like just trying to create trust between the lowest level of government in a lot of countries in which I work, between the lowest level of government and the local government. Trust is, is principle. It's, it's principled in terms of, you know, if people are happy, if people are feeling that they are part of a planning, a participatory government, then you're, you're moving towards where we are. And I think everybody's mentioned trust as a principle. And I think trust is the principle for good government, right, for good governance. But at the same time, it doesn't necessarily have to get in, in, in all quarters of politics. Because for me, it's more about planning, right? It's about inclusive planning. It's about having um, an openness so that the people can see, you know, that, that they can see what their government uh, services providers are trying to do. Not necessarily at every level. Maybe there's some there's and this idea of like the global govern the global transparency movement, and putting data everything out there for everybody. I think there's two conversations which you, you've said, one is politics, and the other is sort of planning and, 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 and services delivery, right? And if people are happy and that their services being delivered, and then, I mean, do they really need to know what's going on in the back quarters of federal government? So, or, you know, as we get closer to the local, this idea of trust and, and services become much more real, <laughs> right, right, real. And if people are happier, they're not necessarily going to want to have everything out there, um, but at the same time, this movement towards global internet and transparency of all data, it's, it's, it's a different conversation than planning and doing business of good government. Um, I don't know, my points are just I, I, I think that's a, I think that's also an important point. Uh, if you have, this I think connects in a way to what Patrick said, if, if you know, I'm a liberal, I'm a, I'm, I'm a I believe in government. I think government can be part of the solution, not part of the problem. But I don't want big government, intrusive government, um, Leviathan government. But you know, the the thing you learn when you're a representative is, excuse my language, how shitty government is at the interface, close up. You know, just apply for a you know, just apply for citizenship in Canada, you know, just apply for, you know. You know, we got a multicultural society. Just try and get a visa so some Indian family can bring their mom and dad in for a wedding or a funeral. You, you quickly discover this is this is not pretty, right? The biggest single challenge for a liberal like myself is at that interface between the citizen and the public, and it's not going so well. So, from that chain comes a whole ripple of consequences. One of them, which is. I'm spending all this money in my taxes every year, and I'm not getting that much out the other end. I'm getting arrogance when I go to a service center. I'm getting, you know, 27-minute waits for, you know. So that there's improvement of service delivery that will have an effect up the chain, is I think what you're saying. And yeah, it has an effect up the chain in the sense that people say, I like these people. They do a decent job. The services, their garbage gets collected. Let them do what they're doing, and in four years, I'll decide whether I want them to continue or not. And then you have, but trust is not just, trust is a social practice. You know, revocable, conditional trust is what makes democracy possible. And that kind of suspicious, revocable, conditional trust is what the whole thing runs on. But if people have had a continuous experience of government's kind of politicians either stealing it and then not delivering the services, it, it just does evaporate. And then you have <coughs> responses that are, that are not helpful, that make it worse. That is, let's make it every meeting open. Let's not trust any politicians to do anything. Uh, let's have the spotlight on them the whole time because, of, and have them keep their hands on the table because if their hands aren't seen on the table, they're stealing other <coughs> And so you then have this downward spiral of, of I mean, the thing that absolutely struck me in, in when I went out of this place into politics 
is everybody thought I was a broken cheat and a liar. <laughs> I write about this, you know, that I had standing as a as an academic and as a professional. I went in politics, I had no standing at all. The, 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 the baseline assumption was that I was in there to steal. And I thought, wow, we, we have got ourselves into trouble here. And, and that's why I think we, we've got to somehow get to a, a place where it's that whole chain, getting government doing a better job, uh, getting people to step up and, and run and show that they can do an honest job. These social practices then have an incremental effect. People say, well, I voted for her, and she actually did what she said she was going to do, and did her best, and on and on it goes. Uh, but we are in a downward spiral at the moment. I, I just think there's no question about it. Maybe I'm too negative. I'm wrong. So I guess I'd like to go back to this Patrick's original question. And, and the question that I would ask, that I guess when we think about um, transparency, the question is, you know, you know is it transparency everywhere you know what is the goal of transparency is there any space for public leaders elected or appointed to have private conversations is every private conversation automatically seen as a um, an act of a betrayal of the public and I think this is and the idea that somehow social media hasn't actually had an impact on it it has the the, the number of independent bloggers um, who have traction in their own, you know, local communities, and the assumption that the, the assumption from every action from some of the bloggers is that you are not to be trusted. I, I believe in strong accountability. I believe that actually every dime that we spend, I believe it should be budgets, you know, across the state, local, state, municipal should all be online. I mean, it just, you know, all of those things, participatory budgeting, and I think it does go back to people feel like they've been a part of the process, and that the process actually reflects their input. You know, that's, I think, what builds trust. But there is this notion that somehow, from some people, and it's not everybody, actually, because people wouldn't get elected if everybody felt like um, public leaders weren't to be trusted. But it is that, 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 you know, very intense few who do treat you. And I have at times said, why would anyone step up and want to do this if you think everything that we are doing is somehow coming from a bad place, when in fact, most electors, um, start from a place of wanting to be part of building healthier communities. It, and so I, I do think it's important we think about transparency and accountability and trust and responsibility. We sort of break it down and say, well, where is there space um, for privacy amongst public leaders? Like where it comes to money coming into politics? Uh, I, for me, the idea of uh, you know, money in politics, I would get it all up. You know, corporations are not people. <laughs> We should not. We should know where every single dime that comes into politics comes from and who's giving it. That that's. Um, but there's, there's different. I guess there's there's different buckets here to think about sort of where transparency, where trust, where accountability is. And, and I would just ask the questions. You started with the, with a great you know opening here to get us going. Is is there any space in public leadership for private conversations? Does that automatically translate into something that is not in the best interest of the public? Well, I wonder if you partly answered it because I was going to say, you know, glasses half full is there are examples of trust being built by opening up deliberation in participatory ways. Mm -hmm. So participatory budgeting and that sort of thing. And what we found in that, and I've worked with politicians and ministers who are very nervous about this, but the paradox is that if you open it up and then you not do what they say, do some of what they say, and say, I'm doing three of these 10 things. Here's why I'm not doing the other seven. Often that peer-to-peer -peer network, the craziest bloggers, they will, you will have other bloggers defend you. Um, and, and I mean, I know this is, there's mixed examples that's early on. But if we want a private space for deliberation, we might also need a more participatory public space so that our leaders, be it bureaucrats or, or elected officials, can come back and say, I heard what you said. This is what we're doing now. Because I think a lot of citizens feel like it's like a PDF. It's read only. There's a black box. <laughs> you know, these things come in through community engagement, but they don't actually address the issues. I don't you know. I think that's a great point. Could I just, just, just build on that, on that theme? Because 
And going back, you know, Professor Nutter, to your example of the, you know, the, the applying for a visa in Canada, thanks for the invitation, um, you know, not being treated well. It, it's partly because actually our frame of reference is now so much, the, you know, the wider market um, that actually might have been treated just as badly 20 years ago, but actually you weren't comparing it with other service experiences. Half an hour on the phone is what you'd expect. So, so our reference point is a, is a consumerist one, and therefore we may be seeing politics and politicians in the light of, well, they just want your dollar, they want their own dollar, what else would they be in business for? So democracy has to be rooted in, in, in practice in civil society. You know, we have a sort of an infantilization of adults so that we, we have an entitlement culture and this is what we expect, which is different to taking responsibility and being involved in democratic processes where you can understand how to trust, how compromise works, how responsibility kind of works. So it's not just the hollowing out of politics, it's the hollowing out of civil society. And it seems to me the great opportunity, and, and linked to what our colleague just stepped out was saying earlier, is that you know, government is this space. If you can unite the public sector with the social sector, the social economy, to, to recreate more of a base of participatory decision making, actually have an incredibly powerful opportunity for you know, a virtue spiral back the way up. I don't think you can just do it in terms of national politics. I think it has to be a much wider thing. Yeah. Would, I'm sorry, I didn't say who I was on the labor Sinclair class of, of 99. Would you address party polarization and <coughs> transparency and trust? Because, well, I think this country is the worst. It's going on everywhere, but if you're <coughs> on that local level, and so many of our local elections are pretty close to a 50-50 split, but you happen to be a liberal Democrat and the Tea Party guy got in, or vice versa, you're not going to trust that person at all. Now, you're going to sit there and go, well, okay, you know, the spotlight's on. I can keep track of what you're doing. But there's no trust in that scenario. And there's more and more of that scenario. And I don't see how we get out of this party polarization problem. Yeah, it, it, it's really an overdetermined problem. There's no single answer. There probably aren't 10 answers, but there are a few that you can have some empirical purchase on. Um, the uh, participation in primaries has gone down dramatically. Uh, in, if you look at congressional off-year primaries, and we're now in another era, another time, moment of congressional off-year primaries, but if you look at the congressional off-year primary in 1966, um, the turnout was just over a third of eligible voters. Just over a third, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, two thirds weren't turned out for a congressional off-year primary. Uh, but where is it now? Uh, last uh, last go round, 2010, last congressional off-year primaries, average nationwide was 16.8 percent, and it's gone down monotonically. Meaning, every two years, turnout in congressional off-year primaries has gone down. Um, and who's no longer turning out? Well, people who are not themselves sort of wing nuts. The, the, people who, who call themselves strong Democrats or strong Republicans are just as likely to turn out now as they were in 1966. But it's the vanilla Ds, the vanilla Rs, or the leanings uh, that are no longer turning out. Another important element has been uh, the increase in something called the primary gap. The amount of time between a primary election and the general election has been going up steadily. So I was in Ohio last week. And uh, last Tuesday, they had um, their primaries. Uh, they had just under 18% turnout in Ohio. Um, and a lot of important things were happening. Well, they're also determining who's going to be on the general election ballot. If you're a campaigner and you're running for, uh, for Congress or the State House or for mayor, you really have two separate campaigns. And you have to win each one. You have to win the primary and then you win the general. But if, if you're in a state like Massachusetts, where our primary gap is very small, when you do your media buys for your primary election in the fall, they're going to have spillover effects for the general election. So the primary gap has increased dramatically. Of course, people are no longer um, in Washington living uh, in Washington. They, they uh, go back home regularly. They, they don't spend time talking to each other. Um, another element that's broken down is the, um, there was a strong norm, very strong norm, until uh, 1994 that in Congress, no sitting member of Congress was allowed to go into the district of another sitting member of Congress and campaign for an opponent. 
could not happen. Right? Uh, but in 1990, in, in, in 1994, that all flipped, and, and now you're constantly going into uh, uh, someone who you're going to sit down later on and have a negotiation. But I've just been in your district raising money uh, against you. And you know the way the way that we uh, gerrymander districts is, has an impact. Um, all of this is a tremendously uh, overdetermined system. Um, I think if there's one thing we could do, it would be fixing the primary system and uh, and increasing the number of people who are involved in primaries and incentivizing more moderates to be able to win in primaries. The interesting thing about the, the primaries is that primaries are a progressive era of innovation. If I'm right, that's right. The primaries it's were designed, supposed to that's designed right. to break up the undue influence of the politicians in the smoke-filled room. Mm -hmm. So this is the deeply connected to transparency. This primaries were supposed to make party nomination process and selection processes transparent. <coughs> it's had these paradoxical and sometimes I think, I think negative effects. I think there's something else in the culture of politics which I, I noticed myself, which is that um, I, I came out of my brief experience in democratic politics thinking that one of the key distinctions that we talk about very little that makes democratic politics run is the distinction between an adversary and an enemy. And that in democratic politics, it is the politics of adversaries. And it cannot be the politics of enemies. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you start wide, there are enemies in democracy, those, that is, who want to use violence to subvert the democratic order. Those are enemies. You know, but a fascist is an enemy in the literal sense of, of enemy of the democratic process. But anybody who accepts the legitimacy of democratic outcomes and campaigns free and fairly is an adversary, not an enemy. And we've created a culture of enemies. And, and, there, and some of it's institutionally driven. I mean, some of it in, in the parliamentary system is, is the dead hand of, of party discipline. If you change the institutions of Canadian parliamentary democracy to increase the number of free votes, allow committees to select their own chairman, um, reduce uh, matters of confidence in our parliamentary system, that is, the elections that do or do not trigger an election are confidence matters. If you reduce those to budget and supply, I mean, this is insider baseball, but and you don't need to follow it, but the point is the institutions have a huge impact on just how partisan an assembly is. And if you, you know, the filibuster rules and all that stuff in Congress. If, but that requires leaders to do something that <laughs> are absolutely against their interest. And I'm speaking to you as a former party leader who held it as tight as I could because I had to keep these folks in line. Right? My credibility as a leader depended on discipline. But it wasn't good for democracy is what I'm saying. It actually wasn't good. And on the other side of this, I see the ways in which institutional change would then reorder the incentives so we get back to a politics of adversaries and away from a politics of enemies. That story about the escalator is very telling. I can tell you identical stories in the Canadian Parliament. Many of you are Americans and think we're a nicer, gentler country. <laughs> Forget about it. Just as nasty, vicious, horrible as you are, right? Um, and, and, and my uh, my escalator story is a story of lining up on Sunday night in Toronto, Pearson Airport, to go back to Ottawa for a week's work in Parliament. The Conservatives line up in the line with their people, the liberals line up, and there is a certain cost if you start fraternizing. You know, this is pathological. We're all in the same business, you know. But that that's a little symbol of the ways in which you got into a culture of enemies as opposed to a culture of adversaries. And you can't run modern democracies without a culture of adversaries. Because the key point about an adversary is your adversary today is your ally tomorrow, mm -hmm. which is the whole point about compromise. Yeah, I also want to say something about, you know, on that point. You know, politics to me is in a way, besides from all the other ancillary, the art of the deal. The deal now has been branded as a real negative. Yeah. yeah. And that's part of the, the problem because, I mean, that goes back to compromise. But, you know, we make deals in our, with our spouses, partners, children, teach. We make deals with everybody, and that's how we move forward. But yet, the deal is now the bad thing. And so, and since I negate, uh, I correlate the deal with 
political in a positive way, meaning moving forward, you know, it, 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 once you, you say that's a bad thing, then what's politics? Where are we going and how do we ever get ahead? I think, so, I mean, I think you, the modern communication is really part of the, the mix here. You know, there's the, the, the role of the court jester to tell the truth uh, in, you know, the Shakespearean plays and whatnot. I think that still plays out now with, you know, John Oliver now with his very pointed, you know, fresh voice. You know, John Stewart, Colbert, and, you know, on Fox News, if you want to take that perspective as well, as comedy. Um, <laughs> but I think that, um, you know, the, the fact that each individual member of a parliamentary system has a direct vehicle, whether it's Twitter or a blog or you know, a local newspaper, the speed of getting your message whether uh, as a way of undermining the leadership or as a way of undermining the opposition or as a way of promoting yourself uh, undermines, I think, the, the, the element of trust in there within the discipline. That you, you know, you, when they leave the room, they can just tweet their opposition and makes you look bad or makes our leader look bad and also makes them look good. And I think that the um, that space of uh, I mean, in the old days, let's talk about vinyl, right? you know, and the mass of, of broad sheet newspapers, the speed of getting dissent and the messenger was much more centralized. So you had, you know, even, in, even back in the 60s with Kennedy, you know, I mean, I'm sure people knew about all the stuff that he was doing, but they, they didn't report it as quickly to the, you know, the ends of the world in a way that undermined the process. Uh, and now I think that's, you know, that's an element in our, fragmentation. On the other hand, I do say to people that people say, ow, oh, your Congress sucks. They, all they do is they scream at each other and yell. And I say, well, you know, the alternative is what? Closed door Hitler, you know, make decisions. Mussolini makes decisions. Stalin behind closed doors and you don't hear it. So I think I'd rather have them arguing vocally than actually behind closed doors entirely. Now there's a, a great space in there. But. Yes, for example. Alex. Uh, uh, graduated MPA. Uh, it, from the conversation so far, it seems like there's sort of here a consensus in the room that there's a problem with an excess of uh, deliberative transparency, and uh, and it might be a symptom of sort of broader shifts that have taken place in the last say, 30 years in, in the U.S. and maybe Canada. And, and I agree with that, but to be a little contrarian, what, like, what, what, what was the reason that that shift took place? And, and I think implicitly with that, that criticism, uh, there's a sense that there was a, an old time where things were better and Washington worked more and Ottawa worked more back in that day. Uh, and there's a sense that we should, if we could just go back to that, and there were more dinner parties in, in D.C. than sort of government would work. And, and I don't think that's true, necessarily. I'm wondering what the elements, what the move towards uh, transparency was aimed to combat, and, and if so, what are the things we need to avoid uh, if we <coughs> step back in, a, in, in, in that direction? Well, there were good reasons for um, uh, disclosing where the money was coming from. You know, Watergate was just one moment in a long sequence of scandals at the national level. Um, uh, we didn't know where the money was coming from, who was actually making the decisions. Um, uh, votes in Congress um, on amendments weren't recorded until the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970. Right? So if you want to look at votes on specific amendments in the 1960s to see civil rights reform, you can't see how people voted on the amendments. They would vote, there was no record, and then they would go out and they would lie about how they voted, right? The civil rights never would have passed if everybody had to record their votes on those amendments. So it was the only final passage that actually was recorded. Um, there was, a, there was um, a real, there were good reasons for not trusting government. Right? And there still are good reasons for not trusting government. Uh, uh, in 1996, Joe and I and Phil Zelko and I wrote a book called um, Why People Don't Trust, or Don't Trust Government. Uh, and I never would have thought then that today would that would look like the good old days, right? It was, it was amazing. Was right. Now we would write why people really don't don't really, really don't trust uh, the government. Um, I think there's a big cultural issue at play here. I mean, every few years we have another generation just kind of 
graduating out of the Kennedy School and taking on reins of power and authority in different venues, some in elected office, many, of course, influencing politics in the public space, not through elective office or directly through government. Um, yet across the country, um, young people don't learn about um, civic affairs, about government in the ways that they used to in ways I thought were helpful. For example, student government, right? Many of you may have been able to run for student government in high school. Well, guess what's also on a monotonic decline over the last three decades is the percentage of high schools that have elected student governments. <clears throat> it's been a very sharp decline all across the country, but most notably in inner cities. So you, know, you have kids now graduating from high school where there was no class president because there was no, there was no class elected student body and um, uh, because the students couldn't be trusted. So you don't, we're, not, we're not helping to, to perpetuate the sense of what politics actually does and what it means to represent people and to serve and to be able to compromise. Uh, not a direct answer, but we're not going back to final. It's pretty exciting. There's so many interesting ways now to engage with each other and to learn about what other people are doing and learn about best practices. It's, you know, it really can be a dramatic step forward. I know in Australia they have laws against libel <coughs> um, that are that are pretty strict. So when you say something about somebody else, you, know, you better have either evidence or you know whatever. So I think that uh, from memory when I was there, that keeps the conversation a little more civil. I would say that it's maybe somewhere between the US and Canada perhaps, but uh, on that spectrum. Um, but I think that you know the the, the social media and, the, and the, the avenues of communication give two give the veneer of equal weight to every utterance of the different levels that I don't think we had before. You know, the, the, the New York Times is competing against the local blogger on some level. And, you know, I think that colors the debate. Uh, the sausage making, you know, is, is ugly and people, they keep looking at it, they keep, you know, thinking about what went into that and they don't, uh, they get mixed up on what the goal is, how tasty is the end product. <laughs> yeah, I think there's no, Question that um, uh, it, it's we've, the technology is super empowering individuals. You know, I, everybody in this room has computing power capable of putting a man on the moon. I mean, it's just unbelievable, uh, and it and that runs against some impulses of team discipline. I just think there's some deep cultural stuff, very hard to. And it was actually difficult to talk to my caucus about why tweeting it right out into the room was a bad idea. You know, it seemed like a good idea at the time because you build relations of confidence with influential journalists that can help your career. And you say, you won't have a career if we don't hold it together. But, I mean, how can I explain this to you? There's a, you know, um, so, so re reconnecting individual ambition and group ambition is crucial, is what politics kind of is, you know. Um, and, and I had I had some difficulty with that, but actually no more difficulty than three preceding leaders who had the same problem. Uh, I, I I feel I want I want I feel an impulse to end on a positive note here. <laughs> I'm, 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 I want to reemphasize what I said. I think there are institutional changes to how democratic politics works that can. I think uh, you change institutions, you can change character and disposition. I, I really do believe that. I think we've, and I laid out a few institutional changes in the parliamentary systems that I know that would, in fact, reduce the power of a leader but empower democratic politics. And you've got to have a leader big enough to say, okay, we're going to do that. Not good for me, but it's good for the system. You've got to. That's almost the key thing, is to get a leader to see that something that is not so good for his control over a party might be good for the democratic conversation and might, you know, politics being politics, give him a medium to learn long-term payoff. That is, a, everybody's sick of politics, so I'm going to do something that ties my hands and it makes politics better, and then I win, right? That's the kind of play I'm, I'm thinking you have to do to change the institution. And then I think all the open government stuff is, is, you know, 
incredibly important. I mean, we've done all the negative side of the, the new media, but, you know, just, this is an, an anecdote, but it happens to be British. You know, I, I tapped in a UK government website the other day to get the MI5 and MI6 military intelligence files on my family. Don't ask me why they have them, but they had 50 years of MI5 <coughs> intelligence files on my family. I put three dollars and fifty cents into my into the UK government's accounts, and the thing <coughs> downloaded onto my computer in three seconds. I had the whole thing in photographic PDF. I mean, unthinkable 60 years ago. Unthinkably good. You know, uh, if I want my mother's birth certificate, she happened to be born in the United Kingdom, I do another little transaction, and it goes ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk. On, on my desktop. I mean, this is enormously positive. And I don't, having said all this stuff about we need, you know, smoke-filled rooms and, you know, deliberation, and it, it's mostly a passion that depends on politics. All this stuff about the deal, which I thought was beautifully said. We're here to make deals on behalf of the people who put us there. That's what we do. And we've got to have some space to deal with the shame, embarrassment, you know, I've, I, I know I said this, but I actually meant that. I know I said this, but actually this is the deal I got to take on. You've got to give people space to do that. That's what politics is all about. Um, but if we could get deliberative confidentiality and combine it with much more open government and the, 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 the uh, participatory budget making, open hearings, all that stuff is just key. And then some changes in the institutions of our representative. I mean, you put all of that together and you get something that really looks good to me. And I, I feel very optimistic about that. But it's got to be systemic. We've got to do all of that, I think, to, to get back to a world in which we have confidence in politicians. Because we see what they do and then we allow them to do what they have to do. Thank you, Mike. And thank you. And let the conversation continue. And enjoy the rest of the day. Mm -hmm.